doctor comes in and he's telling me all this stuff. I said, okay, well, uh, I got to race tomorrow. He goes, excuse me? <laughs> he goes, you don't understand, dude. You got three broken ribs, a punctured lung. By now, they've already got that tube in there. And I mean, I said, look, have you ever been to a dance and watched somebody dance with your wife? Let me tell you something even worse. I said, there's a guy going to drive my race car tomorrow. Can I at least be there to watch it? Hey, this is Burt Myers, driver of the Citrus Safe Modified, and you're watching the Derek Pernasiglio Show. Can I drive you? Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Derek Pernasiglio Show. Thank you for joining us, and we have a very special guest. We've waited a long time to get uh, him on the show. He is a multi-time NASCAR Wheel and Southern Modified Tour Champion, 11-time Bowman Gray Stadium Champion. He is a Smart Modified Champion multiple times there too. Uh, just state championships and a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> uh, the star of Madhouse and Race Nights at Bowman Gray, two reality shows. Burt Myers, what's going on? Hey man? man, I'm glad we finally got this worked out. I know we've been trying for a while to get me down here, but... Uh yeah, glad to be here. Good, glad to good. be here. It, it, it's cool having you here. It was uh, it was great talking to you on the phone last night. You know, just learned uh, uh, so much about you. Then finding out Slate got his driver's license today. That's so funny. And um, has uh, has he he's made his first smart modified tour start, right? Yes, uh, the last race we had at Caraway. That okay. was his first uh, smart modified tour start. You know, he ran Bowman Gray all year in the tour type mod. Mm -hmm. He'd been running some six hundred two stuff. I think his first race ever was at Caraway in a 602. So he had some laps there. So we felt halfway comfortable letting him run the tour mod uh, the last race there at Caraway. So uh, actually, this weekend at South Boston, he'll make his second start. In okay, the Smart so he's Series. running. Yeah, he's going to run. We're going to let him. We went and tested last Friday, and uh, he was within a couple tenths of, of what we were. So. I don't know. We'll see. Oh, good. How, yeah. how did he? How did he like his first uh, uh, tour type modified started? Well, how would you like tour? it? Yeah, I mean, I'd be excited. <laughs> yeah. hey, it's um, uh, it's pretty cool for me to witness for us to kind of see that you know the fourth generation. Right. So, um, and that's actually your first start together, right? Yeah. Well, uh, on, away on from tour. Bowman Gray. Yeah. I, I, yes. Okay. Away from Bowman Gray. Um, you know, I haven't been in a situation where I've been nervous or scared or worried yet. Um, we were talking about it last night. I kind of forgot he was even at Caraway until I see him, mm -hmm. um, which is a good thing because I'm trying to kind of let him do his own thing. We're kind of keeping a finger on kind of what's going on, but we kind of try to put a team together and some people together to kind of let him do his own thing. But uh, it's pretty cool, man. I mean, to, to see him, we go to South Boston and test, and I said, Slate, now he was going to be the first one on the track that morning. It was me and uh, Brandon Ward was there and Slate. And I said, Slate, the tires on this thing are not great. You know, it's your first time here, you know, just take it easy. Second lap by, wow, wide open. So, <laughs> you know, it's, he reminds me of me so much, it scares me a little bit. But like I said, he was within a couple tenths of what we were. So, um, you know, racing and driving is two different things. You know, out there by yourself making laps is one thing, but in traffic and whatnot. Um, but, I mean, so far he's done pretty good. And, uh, you know, there's going to be some lumps and bumps. But, you know, the only way, the way I look at it is kind of like teaching a baby how to swim. Just throw them in. Yeah. They'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. They'll figure it out. But um, the, the, the other question I was going to ask you is, uh, obviously, you know, you race with family out there on the track with your brother. Now it's your son. Is the is is there any different thoughts going through your head when you're coming up to lap him, or or you know when you've gotten next to him on the track or anything? Um, not really. Okay. Um, you know, and he's in a situation now where he's you know he he's competitive, but he's not challenging for the win. And mm -hmm. you know, lots of times I I hope to be challenging for the win. So when we came up to lap him at Caraway, and uh, I saw him, and I was like, man, he must have burned his tires off. Cause we're lapping him right and then we come out we lap him again a little bit later and i was like man that will go on slate what happened and come to find out he had a right rear going down around lap 40 and ran the rest of the race with the right rear going down and after the race it had like three pounds in it oh no kidding. so at the time i'm like doggone it slate man what'd you do and then after the race i figured it out and i'm like man that, not too bad to hang on you know for the rest of the race with the right rear going down and only lose two laps he so, didn't want to come in and change it well he didn't know he didn't know. And uh, I told him, I said, well, now, I said, Slate, uh, and uh, Frank Fleming was, that night we were talking about it, and he said, you know, Slate did a good job. And I told him what happened. He said, we've all had it. We've all had it. And I said, Slate, this was good that it happened because now you know what it feels like. Right, right. You got a right rear going down, now you know. So uh, it wasn't just that you had a, that you burned your tires off. Right. It was that you had a problem. So I said, now you kind of know what that feels like. So 
I mean, it was an odd race, that last race at Caraway. We went from the stage break all the way to the end with no caution. So we mm -hmm. never had an opportunity to pit. Um, nobody did. So mm -hmm. um, had he known, you know, had we had a caution, he could have come in and changed it. But yeah, uh, just welcome, yeah, to, but it's, yeah. welcome to getting a lesson. <laughs> and, yeah. that's, and that's right. And, you know, it's like we talked about on the phone last night, a 20-year-old driver versus a 40-year-old driver. Some 20-year-old drivers have never been through that. Mm -hmm. Me and Frank Fleming have, though, you know? Right. So, um, you have to go through that stuff to learn. And every time I get in a race car, no matter how long I've been driving, um, I learn every time. And that's what I've been trying to instill in Slate is every race you run, every lap you make is a lesson. Mm -hmm. And you learn from it moving forward. Whether you win or you lose, if you learn something, you count it as a victory. So um, he's doing good. He's, I mean, you know, I'm biased, obviously, but – uh, in my cool. eyes, I think he's doing pretty good. Does he work on his own cars? Yes, he does. When okay. he's not in school, um, okay. he loves to come down and, and work on them. And I'm trying to teach him uh, what my dad taught me and Jason was, uh, I'll help you, but I won't do it for you. And I think that the best drivers are the ones that know what makes the car go fast, mm -hmm. know what adjustments to make and what to do to the car. I'm old school. I'm terrible at eye racing because I can't feel it. Right. I can't yeah. feel it. Mm -hmm. I have to feel it. I know. And I can see the car slow down, and mm -hmm. I can see it speed up. But when I go in the corner and I hit on the brake, right. you don't I can't have that feel feeling it. In your I can't ass. feel it in my yeah, ass. I, I can't know. feel it. So uh, he kills me on eye racing, So, <laughs> but that's okay. That's all, you know what, though? It, it, it's it's good for the kids that, that can do it. I mean, I'm terrible at it. you know. And then my nephew, he hops on it, and he can whip a sprint car around the track without a problem, and I can't make a lap. Uh, but I will give it to them because I did use it once uh, before going to run a Concord. Actually, mm. I was going there to run a, a street stock and I just hopped on a video game that had like Concord on it. And I can understand how it helps. It gets you used to your surroundings. Mm -hmm. You know, when I got out there on the track, I'm like, okay, I kind of understand this. It kind of looks like the game. And, yeah. you know, it kind of gets you used to your setting. Really, That's what I took mostly away from. Well, it, and Slate obviously go, lead up to South Boston and going to test last week. Uh, he spent about a week and a half testing at South Boston in a tour mod on his iRacing setup. Okay. And and I told him, I said, Slate, it, what it'll do is it'll, it'll, it'll help you with consistency mm -hmm. and to hit your marks and to be smooth. And on a video game, uh, you know, growing up, we had PlayStation. We didn't have what they have now, you right. know. And, and to me, I think our racing is really cool, but to me, it's just a video game. Yeah, I'm not. I don't mean that in a bad way for the people who use it uh, t to hone their skills. For me, it just doesn't work. But right. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm old dog, hard to learn new tricks. Now I can see where it does help you hit your marks and try to be more smooth. Um, and Slate practiced on it for a week and a half to two weeks of trying to hit that. So he goes out the test last week, and he's riding around slow just as soon as he comes. I said, Dad, this is just like out racing. And I said, uh. well, I said, I said, Slate, there's no escape button. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. You, you, you wreck, have to. Yeah. yeah. You don't hit the button. You don't hit the button over. and start over. Right. So uh, do do you think the ones that like the the cup teams that are using it where they're they're moving and the the, the things are sliding around? Do you think you could that would be better for you if you tried that? I think so. Yeah. I think so. You know, we have he has the it has this you know it's got the you can feel it in the steering wheel. You can feel okay. it in the pedals. It has the butt kicker mm -hmm. it has the full blown racing seat um but it just doesn't have that feel i have people ask me like go to caraway and they said where do you lift at at the sea in caraway and i'm like I, don't, I have no idea well you don't know where you lift i said i know where i feel like i need to lift right. i don't have a mark on the wall right i don't wait for a rev limiter chip right i drive into where i feel like okay that's good yeah and it's a split second decision that you make it's not something that's programmed or right. you know and if and the car's feeling good you can the, drive it you deeper go deeper right. right you know you're free getting in you better not go so deep so uh, to me that's one of the things that i've tried to to get with slate and help him understand is you have to have that feel you have to have that car control and that feel of what it feels like when you do go too deep mm -hmm. uh, when it does get loose getting in what do you do mm -hmm. so um it's it's just a learning process. I'm sure this the the 602 car probably helped him with that because you've got the the, the skinnier tires and they probably slide around a little bit more and, and you got to keep them wound up. So uh, I'm sure that probably has helped him, you know, sliding the yeah, car and feeling it under his seat. That's one of the reasons we did the 602 mod is because well for one thing 
we have modifieds. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't, it didn't make a lot of sense for us to go buy a full fendered car right. when we have modifieds already. Didn't he do go karts though? He before? did one year go karts when he was like six years old. And he ran it? a dozen races or so. Uh, oh. Philip Smith, his grandsons were big into go kart racing. So Philip had a go kart that was one of the one of his grandkids actually outgrew it. Okay. And uh, he said, "Well, we got a motor here and blah blah blah." blah. And we took Slate and did. I don't know, eight or ten races at Woodleaf and did one at Rivers, Riverside, River, River City. Riverhead, Riverside, the one in Madison, Riverside, I guess it was. Okay. Anyway, he did a dozen races maybe. Okay. Um, and he kind of faded out. And he loved basketball, was big into basketball and playing, you know, ball sports. And it was kind of odd because we'd go to the racetrack and he'd be with me. And somebody would say, hey, little buddy, how you doing? You know, you're going to be a race car driver one day? And he would be like, eh, I don't know. And I never said anything, never, you know, never pushed it. Right. And I told Kim, I said, you know, when he gets maybe 12, 13-ish, I may push a little bit. Um, If he doesn't want to do it, I'm not going to make him or push him to do it if he doesn't want to. Um, We got about 12 and a half, 13 years old, and we actually went to, I hope we don't get in trouble for this, we went to uh, (laughs) Caraway. You might have been there that day. Were you there that day that Craig Young had his car down there? Oh. It was it was it a test day? It was a test day, and Craig Young had his uh, the two yellow cars, the O two and the O three. I, I, I could have swore you were Matt. there. I think, I I was think there you were Matt. there that day. But anyway, he let Slate get in the car. Slate had just, wasn't even was he thirteen? He was barely thirteen. <laughs> <laughs> and Craig said, yeah, let him drive it. Let him get in. And Slate put on my helmet and stuff. Sure I, I this. think you were there. I'm pretty sure I do um, remember this. Yeah. So, you know, I just gave him that little taste of what it felt like. And, man, he drove off pit road with a clutch. Um, <laughs> as good as anybody, you know, but a lot of – better than a lot of them do any, you know, this day and time. But right, right. But I think that got the little taste, and uh, and that's all it took. So from there, we, we kind of went the 602 route to get his feet wet. And, okay. Um, but I have told him you I, took one of your cars in the fleet and turned it into a six. We did that. We did to start with. Uh, he ran. He ran the North South Shootout. Uh, he was. He had just turned. Oh wait a minute. He might have been thirteen. He had just turned thirteen, I think. Uh, maybe I, I don't want to get. I, I guess. Well, it's too late. Fourteen. Now. No. He's he's four, no he's oh yeah. Totally you know 14. what? Now that I think about it, he was, he was fourteen four, yeah, years was 14. old. Yeah, he was fourteen. But it was one of my old cars <laughs> that we put a six oh two in. <laughs> And um, and he ran the North South Shootout that year. It's too late now, right? Uh, go ahead. Keep but going. anyway, um, <laughs> we um, we put one of my old cars. We took a, we we put a six hundred two in it, and uh, he finished thirteenth. Didn't tear anything up. Made all the laps, and that was the goal. Uh, and then that winter, uh, with some sponsorship help, we ended up getting a, a new PSR and put that same six hundred two in it. And he got to run some races. So oh, cool. a couple top fives, a couple seconds. Uh, sat on a pole at North Wilkesboro. When we were there with forty eight cars, that's right. So um, yeah, he's, he's he's learning. He's coming into he's his learning. own. That's good. He's and, learning, and he's, he's sixteen years old now, right? He's sixteen. Good. Yeah. Just you know, it's it, it. Bobby Santos told me a long time ago. He was like, "It's laps. It's just laps, 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 laps." Absolutely. Laps. So yeah. Uh, speaking of PSR, uh, holy, they've come onto the scene. Holy cow! Like unbelievable, like wildfire, and they've they're kicking ass down in this neck of the woods well you know you know we had talked about it when we did the segment for Mm -hmm. psr uh the things that we liked about psr number one they were relatively close Mm -hmm. um whenever another manufacturer we sat down and talked to this certain manufacturer chassis builder and he said yeah we're here we're not going anywhere um we're here to stay you know sign up with us and we did and the next thing you know it kind of parted and split and some's here and some's there and it kind of got a little muddy and uh anyway when psr came on the scene psr you know we growing up my dad built of a lot of our stuff mm-hmm. and uh you build a race car you build it practical you build it for, for for performance but you also build it practical and that's one of the things that phil and his team do is they build it practical when you look at the car doesn't look very fancy, like if it's supposed to be a rolled bin, it's squared off, but mm-hmm. it's practical. Man, oh, yeah, I see why you did that. So uh, the thing about PSR is not just that, but the resources that they have and, and the, how it seems like all the PSR guys all kind of work together. Hey, did you, oh, you tried that? Okay, what did that mm-hmm. do? So we all kind of work together uh, for a common goal 
obviously I want to win every race, but when I don't, when I see one of Phil's cars win, I say, like, oh, cool, PSR won today. So, uh, but we like working with Phil and Neil and those guys and, uh, and Jen. It's It's been pretty good so far. And every time you stop by the shop over there, there's they're expanding in some way. Yeah. Or, or, yeah, they're they're expanding in some way, shape, or form. It's, it's unbelievable. But, uh, all right, switching gears now. Uh, going back to your family history, uh, uh, Bobby and Billy Myers, your great uncle and your grandfather, mm-hmm. um, they raced at Bowman Gray, like from the inception. So um, it was only a matter of time before you know the whole family uh, got into it. Um, we were—I would asked you about this last night. Your your grandfather passed away during a modified race at Bowman Gray, right? What he was leading a race on the white flag lap, and from what I was told, he kind of drifted off the track, and the car stopped. He was 33 years old, and they said he died of a heart attack on the way to the hospital. So, yeah, leading a race. Wow. Leading a race. No kidding. Yeah. So, and you know, as I told you last night, when you say a lot of families have given their life to racing. Right. Well, my grandpa and great uncle literally died. Uh, Bobby died in a car at Darlington driving Mm -hmm. for Lee Petty. Um, So, yeah, both of them died at the racetrack. There is video film footage. Yeah, I have seen that. Yeah, Yeah. the motor is like, he gets hit. Obviously, there's no spotters or anything back then. And I think the car is here and the motor is like 30, 40 yards down the racetrack. It was was wild. That was a day, though. That was back in the days when they would start like 70 cars. Yeah, right. I mean, because, yeah, I I know. Think about it. You know, you stop on the track and there's 70 other vultures coming and just, man, just unbelievable. Well, just think about like, and the safety wasn't the safety wrong. man i've seen old vintage cars where, where people have redone some of the old coupes and coaches and whatnot mm-hmm. and i saw one one time it actually had a rope the seat belt was a rope and it had a knot and you pulled it over and you kind of cinched the knot um mm-hmm. but yeah it's uh, uh you know you think about what happened after earnhardt got killed just think about back in those days think right. about you know, they were cowboys back I'm then. I'm telling man. you, man, they it was, were. It was because, wild. <laughs> uh, real quick, two stories. I was at went to Marty Himes Museum uh, on Long Island, and, and you know the modifieds back in the day, the coops and the jalopies, they used to keep the door closed with a seatbelt. They would have a seatbelt that they would wrap around the pillar and the door, and they would cinch it closed, and that's how they kept the door closed. But uh, to talk about the safety, a uh, bunch of years ago, I got to run... Uh, try Richie Evans' old Pinto at New Hampshire. Uh, Ray Evernham let me hop in the car and take a few laps in it. And just driving that car, just feeling how, I mean, there's no high back seat. It was one mm-hmm. of those old fiberglass seats that wraps around your, your midsection. Yeah, I'd go through the corner and my legs would start swinging over this <laughs> way from the, from the G-forces. Right. And you, you'd think about it like, these guys were going a hundred and something miles an hour and battling and just like, how the hell did they do that with sliding around and and you know swimming around in the car like that it just did it didn't feel safe right you know right so yeah that's well and to me i think about like when you think about other sports and we all hear the the analogy and the comparison between michael jordan and lebron james Mm -hmm. it's a different game well think about racing think about back in the day think about what what they do now on sunday when you see the in-car cameras and they look like they're in a cocoon Mm mm-hmm and they just move like this. You think about what you just said. No head and neck restraint. Barely have a seatbelt on. Open face helmet with bubble goggles. Right. A little skinny little window net. <laughs> I mean, you know, you just think about. Right. You think about comparing drivers from then to now. Mm-hmm. Just like you would think about comparing Michael Jordan when he had to play against the Pistons. And they had a plan to attack Michael Jordan in the paint. Mm-hmm. Well, you get that nowadays. They slap him on the wrist. They call, you know, they blow the whistle. Well, you think about. When you talk about racing, about how what those guys went through and what those guys did, and I've heard stories about my grandpa uh, that he literally worked himself to death. That that that's all he did, mm-hmm. and you know that's all he did was he raced for a living. He was racing three or four nights a week. Oh, really? And uh, that that's that's what I've heard. Is that was that common back then. That's though, that's right? the way it was, right? Okay. That was the way it was. Did that, they ever do any moonshining or anything like I, that? That I, I haven't heard. You know what? I, I can't imagine they didn't. Right. Uh, you know, back <laughs> in the day, I guess they all did. Um, but uh, I haven't heard any stories about that. But uh, but yeah, I've I've heard from like people, um, family members that were alive back then that. That he basically worked himself to death. Wow, no kidding. Yeah. The, uh, um, you know, you talk about the safety of it. I mean, actually, look as recently as some of the old pics of your father's cars, like where the, 
the door, you know, the door panel was like right at the yeah. shoulder and stuff. Yeah. You know, in the modifieds, like there was single single tier Nerf bars. Like you look at some of those, and like even my father's midget. Like I, you know, I drove from my father's midget for a bunch of years, and I look at pictures of me sitting in the car now. There was just a high back seat, no head and neck restraints, nothing like that. Just this, you know, the little piece that hung off the right. side of the Kirky seat, and you know that was it. That was it. And, well, yeah. I can remember. Um, Man, I was a kid. I don't remember how old. I was a kid, and it was Richard Childress night at mm -hmm. Bowman Gray, and Earnhardt happened to be there. And my dad grew up with Richard Childress, so we, we had the connection with Childress and Earnhardt with chocolate. Mm -hmm. uh, David Smith was my dad's jack man and crew chief, best friend and whatnot growing up. So we had that connection with RCR and with Dale Earnhardt. Well, then my story is, is Dale Earnhardt was there that night. And the comment was made, Earnhardt, you ought to drive one of those modifieds. He said, I'm not getting in one of those things. <laughs> That's Dale Earnhardt, man. Right, That's right. Dale Earnhardt. So you think about, you know, of course we're biased because we're modified guys, mm -hmm. right? There's nothing like a modified. There's nothing like a modified. If you haven't ever seen a modified, you can watch one on TV, it doesn't count. I'm mm -hmm. talking about stand beside one. They're this off the ground, I know. 600 plus horsepower, 15 inch tires. Uh, 25 or 2650 pounds I mean they're, yeah, I they're rattle your guts when you it, hear them it's, fire it's, up it's like know. yeah it's it's like grabbing a, a cat a wet cat by its tail and picking it up it just <laughs> you know it's 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 wild so uh we're we're I was fortunate blessed I call it blessed to be able to grow up with modifieds mm -hmm. Um, you know, back in the day, I can remember, I know, especially down here where it's all late model country. Yeah, you yeah. Know. Well, we were elite. We mm -hmm. were elite. Bowman Gray was the only place you could go to see modifieds. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I tell people it's a different world up north. Up north, all of your short tracks, the feature divisions modified, whether it be SK or whatever, it's still modifieds. Mm -hmm. If you want to see modifieds in the south, excluding Smart, if you want to see modifieds in the south at a local short track, it's Bowman Gray Stadium. Right. That's it. That's it. So we, we kind of had the monopoly on modifieds in the South. Um, but I can remember growing up trying to make it and make it in racing. And, you know, with oh my God, just let me make it. Just let me make it. Just let me make it. And I had some opportunities here and there. drove a truck one time. And um, in my mind, what I thought make it versus what God had in mind for make it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, right now I think about. You know, 20 years ago, had I not had had I had an opportunity to move up to the na upper levels of NASCAR, I wouldn't have met Kim. We wouldn't have Slate. I wouldn't have my stepdaughter Lauren. Right. Uh, so in my mind, uh, I've made it. Right. Not right. what I thought at the time was make it. Um, but I'm, I'm blessed. You know, they do. And you know, I'm blessed to be able to. I race for a living. I'm one of the few guys in the South that can do that. Now, is it easy? Absolutely not. And I tell Slate, his his teacher asked him where he's going to go to college. And he's telling me and his mom this, right? And he says, uh, teacher asked me where I'm going to college. Kim said, what'd you say? He said, told her I wasn't going to college. She said, excuse me, what are you gonna do? He said, well, I told her I was gonna drive a race car for a living. I said, time out, stop, that's great. And I hope you can, but you better do it on somebody else's dime. Because doing it the way I've done it, I've been able to juggle it enough to make it work, but it's not practical. Right. Um, I told you last night, it's like having a boat. We spend all our time and all our money on that boat, and the enjoyment you get is riding it on the weekend. If you can ride that boat and still pay your bills, you, you know, know what, you it's know what, a good day. You know it's a boat, good day. You know what boat stands for, right? <laughs> what? Break out another thousand. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. So, but you know, I try to give analogies like that to people who, and most of the people watching this are racing people. But for somebody that doesn't know, because you think about if you're somebody that doesn't know racing. Mm -hmm. And you listen to our stories and you watch what we do. And they're like, what? What is wrong with you people? Right. You, know, you spend what to do what? I so, know. Um, you know, I try to give that analogy to somebody that's that does have a boat and they know what it costs. You know, you don't get any return on a boat. Yeah. What return do you get other than riding around on the weekends? Well, that's kind of where we're at. We're not trying to get rich, but um, we, we, we I'm blessed to have enough sponsorship with Citrus Safe and people like that that. I can juggle it enough to make it work, but like I said, it is not practical. Yeah, I was just gonna say you're probably one of the few guys, uh, you know, in the United States that you know makes a living as a weekly Saturday night short track racer. You know, like 
it's blessed it's that's, rare anymore yeah very I'm blessed rare. i really am so that's what, so like what is a a, a a quote unquote work week consist of for you well like um, monday morning you know what? okay so mondays are our work day so mm-hmm. uh, my tire guy david uh he's off on mondays and then doug who is a, a guy that lives there close to the shop oh, so you guys um, have employees too they're not employees they're volunteers oh okay cool. <laughs> oh, all right. yeah volunteers all right which is uh, also rare down here yeah because everybody wants to get paid well the way i look at it is 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 i'm and blessed is all i can say is blessed right. i know i keep throwing that word around but i'm i'm fortunate enough and i'm blessed to have people who love it the way i love it mm-hmm. and they they just want to be a part of it and enjoy it the way i enjoy it mm-hmm. so david happens to be off on monday so david comes down to the shop on mondays doug lives up the road from the shop now doug is retired so doug comes down my crew chief jamie he comes on monday so monday's our work day if we have a decent night the, the, that weekend we can be done on mondays and one of the things that and i hear other drivers talk about this it, it allows us to focus on going fast right because right. you're not fixing the car because i'm not having to i'm not having to go and 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 i get one hour of a night for four or five nights we can go down we can get the bolts checked get the brakes bled get the car cleaned up get the gas cans full get everything done tires and wheels mounted and dismounted and everything and say okay we're ready to go now let's talk about what changes we can we make what shock can we build up what angle can we change what can we do so it allows us to be able to do that and i think that that's one of the reasons that we've been able to have some of the success we have is we can focus on that kind of stuff but uh, i'm just i'm i'm blessed again blessed to have a group of guys that man they just love it just like i do yeah that's it's fantastic um when uh when you do race at a place like Bowman Gray, obviously you probably have to build the car up a little bit more for beating and banging. Um, first off, I give you credit for being able to race at Bowman Gray because the Italian in me would be fighting my way out of there every <laughs> single night. You know? I used to. Yeah, I know. You don't get you don't flip out as 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 much as you used to. Uh, that's uh, that's cool uh, because I remember the. Uh, madhouse promos you just stomping the shit out of somebody's car i forgot who it was but okay which brings me to this question of the age-old question how did the rivalry between the myers and the millers come to be because that was generational wasn't it it was from your dad and junior wasn't it yeah so um i'll I'll start out by saying that i respect junior miller's accomplishments Mm -hmm. on paper junior miller is is one of the all-time modified greats in the south Mm -hmm. but i grew up with my dad if we had if my dad had a bad week at the stadium and tore a lot up we ate ham sandwiches all week Mm -hmm. because we knew that the money had to go to fix that race car right that's another story that people say are you serious why would you do that are you crazy Mm -hmm. but that's just kind of way it was it was a given that the that we were going racing one way or another we were going racing so junior had a lot more money than a lot of the other guys as i was growing up now this is in my eyes and somebody may tell a different story than me but this is in my eyes and what i saw and what i witnessed and what i've been told and kind of what i was a part of is junior had more money so junior were to try to intimidate a lot of people junior would try to bully his way through the field because i've heard i'm not going to mention names i've heard guys say this We've made more money moving out of Junior Miller's way than we ever did trying to stay in front of him. Oh, wow. Okay, then why go? Why go? Because I don't go to follow, and I don't go to let people go. Right. Let's pick a new sport. Mm-hmm. Okay? Now, there was one year in particular, 1998, where me and Junior crashed each other probably about every other week. So growing up, I watched Junior kind of bully his way around. So I would watch him knock my dad, try to knock my dad out of the way, try to do this, try to do that. So I can remember growing up and I said, Junior Miller's not going to do that to me. Okay. And I'm not trying to sound tough. I'm just telling you that I made my mind up at an early age that when I do get into a modified, Mm -hmm. it's not going to happen. And so I can remember just as plain as day, my first year in 1995 and I'm running 12th maybe right just trying to get experience and things were different back then back then if a ralph brinkley or philip smith or one of those guys was behind you and they're putting pressure on you you gave them room you let them go and you followed them and you learned from them Mm -hmm. and today that's not the case today you feel entitled like it's a birthright because you drew in front of somebody and all of a sudden it's your birthright that you think you'd stay there 
even though you're a half a second off. Right. Times have changed, but back then, yeah. well, we're, we're going to talk. We, about we can that get too. into that too, right? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so to go back to the whole Junior Miller thing. Junior Junior had a flat tire. Something happened. He goes into pits. He comes back out. Junior's behind me. As soon as he catches me, pow, knocks me sideways. I'm thinking, all right, because I would have given Junior room, right? If mm-hmm. Junior would have tried to pass me or just tried to move me, I would have gave him room. Junior comes in there, pow, knocks me sideways. Get back to the other end, pow, knocks me sideways. Coming off turn two, he hits me, turns me out through the grass. So when I come back onto the racetrack, we're door to door. So we get to turn three, and I never turned till we both hit the wall. <laughs> that was my first run in quote unquote with junior miller with junior and miller. that kind of just snowballed into every time he was around my dad or my dad was around him or jason was around him it just seemed like that every time we were close to each other you could about expect that one of them was going to run into the other one uh racing with junior like that though i will say probably cost me two maybe three championships because really? uh because i in my mind i was i was hard-headed mm-hmm and uh, I let my pride get in the way of, of success to where I was like, you know what? I don't care. Um, I'm just, this is what's going to happen. And, uh, yeah, but you probably gained about 3,000 <laughs> yeah, well, more I fans. Well, I may have. <laughs> you know, I may have. 1,000 uh, for each championship, you know. I'm telling you, man. But it's, uh, it's all a part of, of growing up at Bowman Gray and, the, and the, the story of my life, how I, from start to end, and well, not end, but start to where we are now. But mm-hmm. uh, it's all been exciting. It's all been and it's, you grew up with you, you know your dad going to Bowman Gray. Slate grew up with you going to Bowman Gray. Real, real quick though, did did your dad run? Um, he ran the uh, uh, sportsman division. He though, ran didn't he? no. He, my dad ran uh, Grand National, which was Cup. He ran a Cup. Yeah, okay, he, ran he did cup. run a Cup car a couple. So times. I think it's from like seventy five ish to seventy eight or nine. My dad got colon cancer when he was thirty. No kidding. Yeah, so he had to scale back. But he actually ran. It was called Grand National back then, which right. was Cup. Mm-hmm. Um, but he actually ran four or five years there. And he Four actually, seasons? Yeah. Yeah, no he kidding. came back to Who Bowman Gray for? himself. Drove for himself. his old car. Drove for himself, yeah. Holy cow. Yep. Yeah. Back then, I, to get the money to be able to go and Don't know. I, I remember the car was baby blue, and it had Spencer's baby wear on the side, one of the pictures I remember seeing. So, uh, yeah. No kidding. But same way, just like that, just like our family's always done, you just work, work, work. Just race is all we knew. Race was all we did. I remember growing up, my dad didn't come to my baseball game or my football game. Right. I didn't hold it against him. I knew mm-hmm. where he was. Right. I knew where he was. Now, I kind of went through that same thing with my kids, and there was a part of me that felt guilty and I hope my kids didn't hold it against me because they knew where I was and knew what was going on. And we joke about how pregnancies, childbirths, mm-hmm. birthday parties, weddings, all of that stuff in a racer's life is I planned know. around racing season. I know. When my wife makes her schedule at work for her vacation days, the first thing she does is pull up a racing schedule. Mm-hmm. That's just how we do it, right? I know. So it's, <laughs> I get it's, it. it's normal to us. Uh-huh. You know, it's normal. During those years that your dad ran the Cup Series, did did you go to any of those races? I don't know. I don't what? remember that. You don't no, remember? I don't remember that. I do know. I heard. I have heard the story that he was racing in California when my brother was born. I do really? know that he was out in California. Yeah, when Jason was born, I okay. have heard that story because Jason will pick at him about it. But, wow. uh, but what I was going to say is he got colon cancer. He had to scale back, mm-hmm. and he came back to Bowman Gray. Um, he started in like the hobby division or whatever it was back in the day at Bowman Gray. Okay, and then he came back to Bowman Gray, and um, there's a program cover with chocolate handing me. I'm I'm four and a half years old. Chocolate's handing me to my dad with my grandma standing there in Victory Lane. And that's the program cover. Um, and I joke with people, I say, man, who would have thought I had my first program cover when I was four and a half years old? Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> uh, but that was when he, he was driving for the Bakers who were teamed up with Junior Miller at one time. So see, all of that was tied in together uh, years ago, years ago, yeah. But that was 1980, it was a black black uh, Plymouth with a oh. white number four on it. Wow. Yeah, 1980. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Now, did uh, did Junior ever run the Cup Series or anything? Yeah, like so yeah. see, I have, my dad doesn't has never really talked to it about it, but talked with us about it. The Talladega story, right? I There's a story about that that Junior tells on the Madhouse Show okay. about how Daddy cheated him out of a motor or something. I don't know exactly what went down. Mm-hmm. Uh, who knows what the story is? I can't imagine my dad cheating anybody out of anything, right. but. Uh, I don't know exactly what the story was, but there was a, mar- a motor that was borrowed and the motor was supposed to be given back or they said, go ahead and run it. I don't know exactly what went down, but Daddy and Junior were so-called friends at one point. 
mm-hmm. and maybe my dad drove a car for junior or dad or something like that so um it, it's it's you know we've all kind of been entangled in this is like drama it's like soap opera you <laughs> know you can't make turns. it up. You, you yeah you can't make this stuff up and you know just like me and tim brown me and tim brown used to be best friends back yeah. in the day we were best friends did you guys uh did you guys go to school together or no we did not tim's okay. tim's about uh let's see i'm getting ready to be 49 tim has got to be 52 okay somewhere in there 53 52 mm-hmm. 53 um but back in the day me and tim my ex and he was dating susan mm-hmm. harwell susan alfred hill's daughter mm-hmm. we'd go ride go karts go to movies go play golf you know this is when whatever you were, you yeah were teenagers we, no we were tim was actually this had to be like 96 ish okay. okay tim was already running modifieds and tim was actually having some success in the modifieds i had i was just coming into the racing scene mm-hmm. i didn't run my first season until 1994 mm-hmm. one season of four cylinders at bowman gray Okay. And so we were best friends. And some of the stuff that Tim, yeah, I told you I'm going to write a book. One day we'll do a show. I'm not going to disclose any of this stuff now. But <laughs> Tim Brown has told me some stuff and showed me some stuff that I wouldn't have showed my mama, that I would have never showed anybody. On the race and, car? Is, yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, but we won't get into that right now. But anyway, back in the day, we were best friends. And I was on a very limited budget. The first year I ran Modified, my dad basically it was an older car he had and he basically said there it is if you want to race it you keep it up and at the end of the year i had to take out a loan to pay off the tire man because i had let my tire bill get up to about 12 or 1400 dollars uh-huh. um i would take if i bent a spindle i would take it i had a buddy that had a big hydraulic press and we would straighten the spindle if i bent a front bumper rear bumper tim brown you know everybody picks at tim about his chrome if tim brown had a chrome front bumper that it got dented in a little bit and he didn't want it anymore he'd give it to me and i'd take a lot of tim's old parts and stuff back in the day okay and um so Same. yeah we were we were tight man we were tight and i mean i still respect him for what mm-hmm. he does and, and the, the fact of it is is no matter if if we are friends anymore if we like each other anymore we still respect what the other one does because we both know at the end of the day we're putting everything we've got into going racing right. and to try to be successful and when you look at history books i think that'll that's oh, you, that's obvious you so. look at look at bowman gray on a saturday night half the the, the crowd's wearing blue the other half yeah. wearing orange you know <laughs> yeah. it's like okay we you know we know where we're at here well i've heard people say it's that we're the duke in carolina i'd like to think i'm the duke but uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway um it, it's 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 been fun it really has been fun um uh, we've had our ups and downs but at the end of the day i think we both respect each other just because of, of what we both have given right to modified racing especially at bowman gray yeah and, and you know tim always comes to the track you know correct he's always got pretty cars they you know they're always well prepared and you know i do want to get him on the show too we're gonna we're gonna talk to a lot of those guys but uh speaking of you know bowman gray and also the, the guys in the cup series what are what are your thoughts about the clash coming to Bowman Gray? The, the cup ah. cars coming. Has any of the have any of the guys actually called you and asked you how to get around there? I've had a couple conversations with Kyle Kyle Bush. No uh, kidding. Yeah, we've had a couple conversations, and we're gonna we're gonna do some stuff. Um, so I, I talked to Kyle about the rumor. Okay, we're gonna call it a rumor because we don't know for sure. But the rumor is is that they're gonna have a uh, Bowman Gray night on Saturday night with our regular Bowman Gray show. Oh, really? And then we'll leave, and then Sunday Cup comes in for the clash. Mm-hmm. And I said something to Kyle. I said, "Man, you ought to, you ought to drive one of my modifieds that night to get some seat time." And I think NASCAR is going to probably going to frown upon that, and they're not going to let them do that. But um, we've kind of talked about a few things, and it's ironic because Scott Widener, who used to be my crew chief back in the day, mm-hmm. uh, works for RCR now. So I think him and uh, Kyle have also had some conversations about Bowman Gray, but. The thing about it is, is I think it's what's cool about it is, is the fact that NASCAR, you know, Bowman Gray's always been its own entity. It's you know a, what I mean? An it's, anomaly. It's, it, it really, it's been its own little animal. It's kind of all. It's been by. It's, it's been kind of over here by itself. Right. Now the part that, the part that bothers me about uh, Bowman Gray on a national scale, is that if you've never been there, a lot of your thoughts are negative because you do a hundred good things and one bad thing is what pops up on youtube well the, the, yeah i was just gonna say the the fighting and, and the, right the, the, the retaliation right. i mean that gets spread around and then of course now with the streaming you know with, with right. the cameras picking it up you're right you're seeing it everywhere but the thing about it is is bowman gray is still it, it's very entertaining okay mm-hmm. we all know that it's 
the format is designed for entertainment. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you don't buy into that, you have a really hard time racing at Bowman Gray Stadium. <laughs> okay, there have been drivers who said, "I'm going to run a full season at Bowman Gray this year in a modified division," and after about three weeks, they're like, "Man, this guy did this and this guy did that," and we're a hundred laps into a race, and the guys. I mean, it's a 100-lap race that we drew the whole field. And a particular guy, he knows who I'm talking about, too. And I'm not going to call his name but because we're friends. But uh, I'm running fifth, and he's running sixth. And we're 20 laps into a 100-lap race. And the cars in front of me are mid-pack cars. Mm -hmm. And the guy behind me is wailing on me, wailing on me, wailing on me. We have a caution. He pulls up beside me, and he's like, come on, come on, let's go. I'm like, dude, we're going to have at least six more cautions. Just chill out, you know? <laughs> and I end up winning the race. The guy comes over to me after the race. He's like, man, I was ready to go. I said, where? Where were you going? Where were you going? We were 20 laps into a 100-lap race. Right. You know you're going to get cautions, okay? Mm -hmm. And I love it when they call them Burt Myers cautions, right? There's no such thing as a Burt Myers caution. <laughs> There's no such thing as a Tim Brown caution. Right. There's a Bowman Gray caution, mm -hmm. okay? It's for the show. It's not for Tim Brown or Burt Myers. Right. I've heard them say, well, when Junior Miller used to go into pits, he'd slow the pace car down. They may have, but right. they didn't do that for Junior Miller. They mm -hmm. did it for the show. And so you have to buy into that mentality of there's things that are going to happen. And I tell Greg Garrison this all the time. There's things that they do that I do not like. Okay, right. if I qualify on the pole for a 100-lap race, that's where I want to start. But I know why they draw. I know why they invert. I know why they put a cone out there. Because they put 15,000 people a week in the place. Right. They have a full field in every division. Right. And now what do we have? NASCAR Cup Series is coming there. So don't right. tell me that Bowman Grady is not – successful when Bowman Gray doesn't have a grand master plan of why they do what they do because now we've drawn national attention and now you got a NASCAR cup race coming to Bowman Gray Stadium around a football field right okay I know. they must be doing something right well when when I heard the announcement for the race the immediate, the immediate thing that I thought was okay if, if I'm a 12 year old kid and I go to my weekly track and now the Cup Series is coming to my weekly track where I go and enjoy racing every week. That is huge. That's I pretty get to cool. see all these legends and they're coming to my backyard. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So, that's yeah. pretty cool. The only thing that's going to be any cooler than that is if I get to run that clash. Yeah, I was just going to say, okay. can you get in a car? I don't know. See, I don't know what the format is. I don't know if I'm even eligible to. Uh. I don't know if I'm even eligible to. I can't imagine, I can't imagine that, that there could be a sponsor out there yeah that would be willing to jump on board to take this chance right. to put me in a car, okay? No matter where I finish, because I, I I feel like I could run pretty good there, okay? Oh, I know. So, but no matter where I finish, let's just take that out of the equation. It's something to talk about. Yeah. It's something to talk about. Oh, uh, absolutely. So you can't tell me that there's not enough exposure there to make it worthwhile to come on board, to team up with a team to put me in a car for that clash. Like I said, I don't even know if I'm even eligible. I'd like to think I was. I don't, right. know, I don't know what kind of format they have nowadays for the for the clash. Yeah. But that's the show business right there. That's uh, it's it is a game. It's yeah. a game. And 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 I tell people, so I tell Slate this all the time. You got to know you, whoever plays the game the best is the most successful. Mm -hmm. And sadly today, you don't have to be the most talented. Yeah, you just got to know. know how to play the game the best. I know, and that's, um, that's and, the tough and, part. And, about and, this. and I and I've, I think I've done a pretty good job of that, just because I've had to do it myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little joke. It's not a joke, but it's a running joke in our family. My mom takes my dad a cup of coffee every single morning. Every single morning, she takes him a cup of coffee. When she doesn't bring a cup of coffee, he says, "Where's my coffee?" Right. The first time. The second time, the third time, she doesn't bring a cup of coffee. He's eventually going to have to go do it himself, right? Mm -hmm. I've had to do it myself. So the, the, the guys who haven't had to do it themselves, okay, uh, and we won't get into all of that. You know, we had some conversations about this last night about, you know, yeah, we'll get how, into a certain, little bit. <laughs> how certain people are plugged into certain situations, right, yeah. um, who maybe didn't earn their stripes. Right. Um, if I didn't come up with the money – to go race, guess what? I didn't go race. And uh, there's times where Kim says, hey, you got $400 in your checking account. What are you planning on doing this weekend? Mm -hmm. I pick up the phone and I hustle and I and I try to make it happen. And um, sometimes some of the money come from this account to kind of cover this account till you can get some money and we've shuffled it. And you know, that's what I watched my mom and dad do my whole career. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I kind of adopted that and I learned how to, to do that and play the game and, and um, 
it's pretty cool. Like when you're uh, uh, Tommy Lancaster with Citrus Safe said they were in Nashville a couple of years ago, and he had on his Citrus Safe racing shirt. Some guy across the street goes, "Yeah, Citrus Safe, Burt Myers, baby." <laughs> Out of the blue, right? Okay, so I think we've done something right. Right, we've done something right, and uh, it's and that's what it's about. It's a not. It's not necessarily about. I see this all the time. A guy will get a sponsor, mm-hmm. and they'll take the check and they'll say, "All right, thanks," and that's it. Right. I make it a challenge to see how much exposure I can get you Mm -hmm. because I want you to be happy. If you write me a check and you're not happy, you're not going to continue writing checks. What are some of the things that you do to get your sponsors exposure? Uh, And, 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 you know, explain it because we have, you know, people that are listening that could probably get some good advice here. Well, and I'll be the first to tell you, I don't do as good a job as I should. Oh, really? I don't do as good a job as I should. Uh, The first thing is, is doing what I'm doing today. Right. Okay, doing what I do today. You don't see me at the racetrack without a Citrus Safe racing shirt on. Mm-hmm. You don't see me do a TV show, a radio show, anything that's visual. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't see me do it without a Citrus Safe racing shirt on. Right. Um, that's because they've earned that. Mm-hmm. They deserve that. And I owe it to them to do that for them. Um, every time you're on a microphone, every chance you can to, to make a post on a, on a social network, um, just anything and any any time any can any way you can just mm-hmm. any way you can to and I, I've got lots of partners but you know Citrus Safe obviously obviously is my primary uh, partner uh, and that's another thing too I had a kid ask me about well, how do I get sponsorship I said first of all change that word he said what do you mean I said it's not a sponsorship it's a partnership mm-hmm. it's a partnership you're gonna help me get in Victory Lane by get, helping me financially to get in victory lane and when i get in victory lane i'm going to help you get exposure that gets you more money so you can write me more checks so i can get you more exposure right and it goes back and forth and back and forth it's a cycle it really is a cycle Mm -hmm. so um you just gotta you gotta know how to play the game to make it you gotta make it fun and here's the other thing Derek. i love what i do i love what i do so it makes it easy for me it's not like a, a job, mm-hmm. and like here's the word blessed again. I'm blessed to be able to do this. You mm-hmm. know, I, every every day that I get to go work on my race car. I mean, think about what I just said. I get to go work on my race car. Okay, and Kim will joke with me. You are, are you gonna come home from the shop? And I'm like, do you think I want to be here? <laughs> <laughs> it's not that I want to be there working on my race car, but right. man, there's other places that, that I if i had to go would be a lot less fun right so um, it is it is a cool job but at the end of the day it is a job it's still work right it's still work it's still and that's work. what i love it i love this when people say junior miller used to say it on the tv show call me mr mom <laughs> and, and you know he don't have a real job my brother tells me that all the time you don't have a real job you don't have a real job <laughs> i got news for you and i don't i don't mind saying this i outwork most of those guys that say that right i may not be punching a clock for somebody well i know but i outwork most of them right right okay no, i uh I so get it, it you, you can call it a job or a real job or a mr mom or whatever you want but tell me why if if it means coming home if it means now slate can drive so that's off my plate but picking up slate from school coming home throwing a load of laundry in the dish in the wash i mean going by the store and getting some stuff and having supper ready when kim gets home Mm -hmm. you can call that whatever you want to man but if i can do that and still go racing for a living right trade me yeah trade me you know i'm blessed to be able to do that so if junior miller calls me mr mom because i do that (laughs) i laugh at it you know what i mean you know and it's also not bad to have those skills either because i mean hell i remember going through my 20s and my 30s being you know single and having to you know keep up with my own house and all of that and yeah i I get it Uh, and now you know uh being that i have uh businesses too i have a small property company and a production company I, I tell people you know i don't have a job but i get up and i work every day that's right every that's single right. day so uh that was going to be the, the the next thing that we talked about you know the, the the kids that are coming up you know we've got slate driving now we've got baldwin's kids that are running we've got uh brian lofton's son carson that's racing you know at one point you were the kid racing with these veterans now the shoes on the other foot what's that like for you um I don't look at it much different. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't really taken the time to think about it until you just ask me. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I look at it. There are, I evaluate every car. Like I watch. I, I don't miss a lot. That's the best way I know how to put it. I don't miss a lot. Like I, I'm, I'm a people watcher. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm always aware of my surroundings. 
And so that translates over to the racetrack. Uh, so I will constantly watch. And these kids are impressive. They really are impressive. On Sunday, some of these kids that win, uh, when you see the in-car cameras and they're in there like this, right? Mm -hmm. So to do what some of these kids are doing in the modified division, you have to have talent. You have to have skill. I think the biggest thing that you're seeing with, hopefully with Slate and with the Baldwin kids and with Lofton, they grew up in racing families with mm -hmm. dads who raced, and they watched how to do it the right way. Right. Some of the kids coming in now maybe went to their dad. Their dad's financially stable, and they said, Dad, I want to go racing. That sounds cool. And next thing you know, they buy a ride somewhere, and they tear up car after car after car. I'm not saying that that's not possible, and I'm not saying you still that you can't have success at it. And I'm not I'm not trying to downplay it whatsoever. But I think the ones that have the most success are the ones that we just named that grew up coming to the racetrack, mm -hmm. grew up respecting other drivers, grew up r respecting your equipment. Because that's another thing. I, you race with some guys sometimes who just show up with a helmet. You can tell who those guys are just by racing with them. You don't have to know their name. You don't have to know who they are. I can just tell by racing with them. Because if you don't respect your own equipment, you're not going to respect mine. Right. And that's one of the things about the Smart Series, especially in the olden days, and now majority of the teams now are family teams. They're family teams. I don't care what kind of money I got. I could hit the lottery tonight. I'd have to play it. But <laughs> yeah. if I hit the lottery tonight, that doesn't change how I'm going to drive you on the racetrack. Whenever they check up in front of me and I dip my front bumper in, I go, crap, man, that's 100 bucks." Mm. Because I'm always thinking about it. Me and Danny Bone joked about whenever there was, there was a stack up at Franklin County, and he said, man, you killed my whole back panel. I said, I know, I killed my whole right front in the process. Mm. And Danny Bone right. had to build his car back, and I had to build my car back. And we joked with each other about it, but that's the way we look at it. Right. It's, it's not it's, like you want to do it. It it's happens. Not, right. It yeah. happened. But the thing about it is, is you respect it. Mm -hmm. You respect it. And I felt just as bad as I felt about my front end getting knocked in. I'm thinking, crap, man, I didn't mean to. Danny, I'm sorry, man. I didn't mean to crash your whole back in. Mm -hmm. But when you race with some guys that don't respect their own equipment, that know when their car gets tore up, they won't see it again until it's ready to go racing again the next weekend. Mm -hmm. Those guys race a certain way, different than the way somebody like me might race because they don't respect their own equipment. So um, going back to your question, I think that when you look at the, 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 the kids that we just named, they do respect their own equipment because um, they were taught to, number one. But number two, they're probably working on their cars, too. Right. They're probably having to be there and, and having hands-on and, and making sure it gets fixed. Do you so, make Slate work on the cars? Absolutely. Good. I don't make him. He does. He, he's, well, I say that. <clears throat> there are times where I say, Slate, now, if you're going to run South Boston, just a couple weeks ago, I said, Slate, if you're going to run South Boston, you need to find a day that you can come down there and get your car cleaned up and go over your bolts. And he's like, man, I hate checking bolts. I said, me too. Me too. We all hate checking Part bolts. <laughs> but if you're going to race, that's what's got to happen. And so, yes, he's uh, obviously school has to come first right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but now that he's got his license, I told him a couple of days ago, I said, when you get your license, now, there's going to be days, there's certain days, these school schedules kill me. There's certain days he gets out at 1230. There's some days he gets out at 140 and some days he goes all the way to three. I don't know about I don't know about you, but when I was going in school, we got out at three or three thirty every single right, day. Every day. <laughs> so these kids are getting these half days all of a yeah. sudden. I don't know how, but and I rode the bus to school. I, I did too. Okay. We did the bus, right? Yeah. Well, now see, Slade is he goes to Trad um, Trad Baptist where we go to okay. church. That's where he goes to school. But he's going to so, start driving himself though, right? Yes, but it, what I was going to say is it's, it's private school, so they don't have school buses. Okay. So that's why he drives himself. But um, but anyway, I told him I said, you know, there's going to be days where you're going to have to. When you get out at 12.30, you just head on down to Walnut Cove and come to the race shop. So <laughs> He's excited for it because, I mean, he's, he's, you know, they say it's in your blood. Mm -hmm. I think you're a victim of your environment mm -hmm. or a product of your environment. Not a victim. That was a bad word, but uh, you're a product of your environment. So well, you know what I think it was, too? I, I think that, you know, you grew up going to Bowman Gray, <laughs> you know, seeing your dad race there and seeing, you know, how the crowd reacts, the, you know, that because I'm sure that they were just as wild then as they were now, probably even wilder because there's no cameras and, and cell phones. Um, so I'm sure you saw that aura of it and thought, you know, this is wild and this is cool. And then him growing up, seeing you win, because he's been watching you win since he was a baby, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, you know, he sees when he walks out, all those people screaming and cheering, you know. 
And now I'm sure he's got a good following screaming <laughs> and cheering for him because he's a Myers, right? Yep. So He's got both ways. Yeah. Both ways. He's it goes good. both sure ways. Sell, I'll tell you a funny I'm story. I'm sure he's selling t-shirts and signing <laughs> yeah, autographs. Yeah, he does. Somebody asked me yesterday. We were. Uh, I got a new shirt coming out. It's supposed to be done for this weekend. Okay. Uh, it's an 11-time champion shirt. And we normally we don't do championship shirts, but this one was kind of special, and I'll tell you why. I won my first championship in 1999. Mm-hmm. This is 2024, so it's 25 years between the two championships. Mm-hmm. So it's the 25th anniversary of championships at Bowman Gray Stadium with 11 scattered out through there. So uh, we were joking about it yesterday because we were talking about T-shirts. And one of my guys said, um, does Slate sell more than you? And I said, well, sometimes he does, you know. But it's <laughs> funny because Slate sells a lot of smalls and mediums. Oh, for the kids. The little kid, the younger girls right. and whatnot, you know. So, uh, <laughs> But I'll tell you a funny story, and you'll appreciate this. Cause I'm, I'm sure he's got a lot of young girl fans. A lot, fans. Of, lot of young girl fans. So mm-hmm. I'll tell you this, and, and you can relate to this because um, – Back in the day from Dirty South, like when, when I when I put, the first time I put Dirty South on my car was for the very first North-South shootout. Mm-hmm. Well, the media probably made it worse than it was, but back when I was growing up, the Northern modified teams and the Southern modified teams did not get along. Yeah. Okay, we, there was, we would clash. So we would kind of look sideways at each other whenever we did have a race where we raced together. So like whenever North, North Wilkesboro and Martinsville, North Wilkesboro, Martinsville, and then when the North South shootout was coming, and I was going to be a part of it, and I put Dirty South on the front of the car to kind of as a jab, right? And then the media was making a big deal out of it. Now, and I know you won't, but when I was growing up, we were the Rebels, and the Northern guys were the Yankees. Mm-hmm. Okay, we would say the Yankees are coming. Right, the Yankees I know. are coming. We didn't mean disrespect. Right, and the, I still I'll, get called the Yankee. The Yankee, right? But I'll give you a relation: is like when I call Kim my old lady. Mm-hmm. Okay, in the South, when you call your wife your old lady, that's a compliment. Mm-hmm. That means that's my woman, mm-hmm. right? So same same scenario. When we say Yankee, we didn't mean disrespect. Right, it's just what we said. So whenever the Dirty South came along, and I put Dirty South on my car, and we kind of had a uh, love-hate relationship there. Well, I think one of the things, I won two North-South shootouts at Concord, mm-hmm. and I made friends with Ted Christopher and Mike Stefanik and a lot of the guys up north, and Dave Sapienza is one of my best friends. So I've got a lot of relationships with guys up north now, and I think one of the things that changed some of that is when we did have the TV show, that a lot of those guys realized, man, these guys, these guys do what we're doing. These guys are putting their effort in and these guys are working hard to, to they love modifieds just like we do. Right. So the relationship kind of opened up to where I have a lot of Northern friends now. Uh, but to get to my story, so one of the few, t- one of the first times we took, I was driving Eddie Harvey's car and I was going to go to uh, Thompson. Mm-hmm. I was going to run Thompson. And it was me and Kim and Slate and we're in the rental car and we're driving from the airport over to Thompson Speedway. Slate must have been, gosh, I get lost, so lost in time, 10, mm-hmm. maybe 10 years old. And uh, Kim said, now, Slate, you know, we're, we're going into pits up here at Thompson. And, uh, you know, you, you might hear some some language that, that you know <laughs> is not appropriate. <laughs> so whenever you hear it, just just be cool. And, you know, just you, you know that it's a bad word, but just don't say anything about it. And Slate gets a crossways look on his face, and he said, Mom, you know I grew up at Bowman Gray, right? <laughs> so... That ties into what you're talking about, about growing up at Bowman Gray and how wild it was and how crazy it was. And yeah, it's always been that way. Mm -hmm. It's always been that way. Uh, When I was a kid, you know, I can remember it was probably worse. Like you said, I can remember people throwing stuff on the racetrack and yeah no there was I some remember, crazy stuff man yeah I, I remember going to bowman gray actually one of the first times and you had won and, and you had you, you had pushed your way to get to the front it was 2004 and you had pushed your way to get to the front you had gotten the lead and then the caution come out and i was shooting with a video camera and uh all i remember is seeing shit coming out of the, <laughs> the grandstands and hitting, i don't hitting, doubt it hitting the roof of your car uh, that was that was pretty wild but uh yeah you did get to do a, a small stint on the the nascar wheel and modified tour Running uh, up there, did any of uh, did any of uh, racing up there with those guys and those tracks uh, help you uh, down here? Or? Um, yeah, well, I mean, like I, like we talked about, anytime you get in a race car, you learn, mm-hmm. especially when you go to somewhere new and mm-hmm. race with different drivers. Um, How did you like going to some of those tracks? I love there? it. I love it. Stafford, I love it. Thompson, I love, I love. I love Thompson's probably my favorite of the. Yeah. Well, of New Hampshire is my favorite. Um, but then when you just talk about like a local short track, uh, Thompson, then probably Stafford, I did Riverhead, 
Uh, I did uh, Waterford one night. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got to do I've gotten to do a few of those shows. There's still a few tracks I'd like to hit um, at some point, but so you have to think about it's a different mentality and a different driving style. Mm-hmm. In the South, we were weaned on tracks that had no grip that were abrasive. Mm-hmm. You got four tires, five if you were lucky. You got one change tire if you were lucky. Mm-hmm. So you had to manage, right. right? So you didn't, the fastest laps you went all day were qualifying. Okay. Every other lap after that was, you know, 25, 30% off the pace because you had to make sure you had enough tire lift to run the whole race. Mm-hmm. Up north, a lot of the tracks have got good grip. They're not so abrasive and they might get three or four tires to put on. So they can drive hard all night long. Mm-hmm. So whenever you combine a Southern driver and a Northern driver, and you put those two different personalities and driving styles together, it can cause, if you're not prepared for it, it can cause some some problems. Mm-hmm. Um, I embraced it. I loved it, right? So I can remember growing up, we went to the Myers Brothers Award and when, when they had it in New York, at, we, they would put us at the Waldorf, Waldorf Astoria. And my mom had me drive. She said, I don't want to drive in the city. You drive. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, all right. It is. It's, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, they're that far off the guy in front of them. And, and you know, when you're merging, you're you're barely missing you're, each other. Yeah, right? I know. And, you're and rubbing your fingers. mom or your wife or whoever is screaming. And I'll tell them, when you listen, in racing, it doesn't matter how close you get as long as you don't hit. Right. Right? So that's how I was driving. Well, think about how, because you've been to both. Think about how they drive in New York City. Mm-hmm. And think about how they drive in downtown Mooresville. Yeah. Two different. You got a car length and a half in front of the guy in front of you. Mm-hmm. And you're ready to blow the horn because the light's green and he's not moving. You don't have that in New York City, do you? <laughs> no. All right. So now put that in a mod- put that guy in a modified car. Right. Put that guy in a modified car and put the guy in Mooresville in a modified car. Yeah. Those are two different personalities with two different backgrounds, two different environments. Mm-hmm. And when you put those two together, it can cause a problem. I can remember one of the first times, and uh, he'll, I, I told Ryan this story. But wait, but you had to have felt familiar when you went to a place like Riverhead, because that probably felt like Bowman Gray. It did, but it didn't. Believe it or not, the night that I went, everybody talked about how wild it was. And the race, before the race I went, it was like eight cars finished a race. And just ready, just get ready. This is yeah. going to be just like Bowman Gray. Yeah. And I think we had two cautions all night long, and there was... You know, most of the field finished the race. So it, it, I didn't get my full taste of what they said Riverhead was like. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really enjoyed running but Riverhead. You ran two races? I ran there? two there, and both what? of them were, were relatively calm. Oh, they okay. were, they were. They were tour um, races. They were tour races, okay. uh, driving Eddie's car. Uh, <laughs> but I, what I was going to tell you is about, um, I told Ryan Priest this story. We were at uh, Caraway for a North-South shootout. And after the race, my mom comes up to me, and she goes, I'm going, you wait till I see Ryan Priest. I said, what's wrong? She said, well, coming out of straightaway, he hit you at the flag stand. And then when y'all got in the corner and he ran you up the track, and I'm like, I don't remember that. <laughs> she <laughs> goes, well, he did. I said, Mom, you have to understand, it's a different mentality. It's a different driving style. I loved it. I mm-hmm. loved it. When you see your your Monsignors and your Silks, and they go in there, and they one slams into the other one, and they do a crossover, and they slam at each other again, and they go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and then after the race, they go, good race, man. Right. You know? I not don't, every I time. don't think they say good race. Maybe not <laughs> those two. I was just trying to give an <laughs> yeah. example no of, one's you know. Silky and Vonson, you're right. I don't think they say good race. But there's still a mutual <laughs> respect for for the other driver and the other team. Right. You know what I mean? I and, and, but uh, I, I was just, exaggerating I'm just a so bit, not a fan of the bump and run shit. I just, that's why I give you guys credit about racing at Bowman Gray, you know, I mean, and, I, and I've fought with people on social media, all the, the whole Rubbins racing thing, and oh my God, I just, it drives me nuts. I mean, I come from the open wheel world where, you you know, you, you race them, you know, you don't, you don't pop them in the ass and send them up the track and go past them. I, I you know, so for me, uh, I get it. I I'll totally understand you live and die by the bumper at Bowman Gray, which is also why I don't race there. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, we'd be fighting to get out of there every night. Well, here's the difference, right? Um, if you look on my Facebook page, on my fan page, it says, if you're using your back bumper to keep me behind you, it's my job to use my front bumper to get past you. Mm-hmm. The first thing I want to do is pass you, not, not move you. Mm-hmm. The first thing I want to do is pass you. And I'm going to try. I'm going to try several times to pass you. If you are using your rear bumper, if I'm faster than you and you're using your rear bumper and using your car to make that more difficult, what choice do you give me? 
So that's not putting the blame on me. That's putting right. the blame on you. No, I get, I get. You know, if you're block, you know, you block somebody for fifty laps. Don't be surprised if they move you. I get that. It's the coming to the checkered flag. You know, now, there are someone. some, there are some <laughs> situations that were. You know, we all know about the Austin Dillon deal yeah. at, at Richmond. Right. You know, I, I see both sides of that. I do, I do. I see both sides. I think that. Uh, I want to be careful here. <laughs> Go ahead, <laughs> because I, you know, I, I like Austin Dillon a lot. Like I said, the whole relationship with, that my dad had with Childress, and right, that right. we, you know, uh, but just that, not even Austin but here's Dillon, the that deal. move in general. Here's the deal: Austin, Austin made a choice. Right. Austin made a choice, and mm-hmm. in his mind, he did what he thought he needed to do. Okay, he's a big boy. Mm-hmm. He put his pants on just like everybody else did that morning, and. He had to suffer some of the repercussions from from, from the choice he made, mm-hmm. right? Now, one of the questions that you probably haven't heard somebody ask Austin Dillon is, would you rather finish second and not been penalized? No, I get How it. do you answer I, that? I get guys, you know, like, guys want to win. You know, so it's – it's there's a fine line there. There yeah. really is a fine line. And, and you know, uh, when somebody's desperate enough um, – they do things that, that oh, they, desperate people do desperate things. So. And well, the worst. Well, <laughs> and, and the worst part is, is the younger they they are, the more apt they are to using it. Because I recently watched the the late model race from Martinsville, and I would say seventy to eighty percent of the passing out there had to do with bumper to bumper contact first. You, yeah. you know, so that. Uh, it just that just gets yeah, me. but that's 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 short track racing. I get it. You know, when you, when, you, when you go to when you go to a bigger track, you see less and less of it. Right. I you know. Um, but like I said, I come from the open wheel world. Right. Like midget racing. You know that. But, kind but of stuff. just think about when we talk about Bowman Gray, we talk about the formula: mm-hmm. flat quarter mile around the football field, twenty five cars, and they draw the whole field. Guess what's coming? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's only you know there's a sequence here, right. and there's there's there, there's a there's a there's an end to it here, which means bumper. Right, it means bumper. I get you. Uh, now I'm all for, I, I'm I'm okay with moving me, if you're faster than me, if you're faster than me and you're working me and I'm not giving you the room and you move me, not wreck me, not turn me, but move me. Mm-hmm. I'm okay with that because how can I be mad at somebody for doing something I would have done? Okay. I'm okay with moving me. What I have a problem with is what I watched Junior Miller do for years is he did it to me, and, and it's not just me watching, and I'm not just making accusations. It happened to me when I was going to win my first smart race in 1998. Mm-hmm. I had a good straightaway lead, and Junior caught the guy in second and spun him out to get a caution. And we go down, and there's a video of it floating around somewhere. I think they might have played it on the Madhouse show. Where Junior, was it, a Caraway? It was a Caraway. Okay. It was a Caraway. And Junior, we took the white, and Junior almost hit the inside pit wall. He went down so low so he could clip me to take me out. That I have a problem with. Okay. When you overdrive your car to run into me, or if you run in a groove you shouldn't be in to start with to try to run into me, then I have a problem with that. Now, I'm not trying to be a hypocrite because I've done it. Right. We've all done it. <laughs> We've all done it. But there's times back in my earlier career where – I didn't race but for one thing, and that was to get the trophy at the end of the night. I didn't care. I was Austin Dillon. I didn't care. I didn't care what happened. I didn't care who I made mad. I didn't care how much money it cost. It was, I'm going to win this race tonight. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you won, but sometimes you paid the price for it. And, uh, you know, there's been times where I was retaliated against because I moved a guy a week before, something like that. And it probably cost me some wins and cost me some championships. But the older you get, that's not just in racing, but that's in life. The older you get, you kind of mellow out a little bit and you start refocusing, you know, the, the big picture, the big picture. And I'm not talking about championships and points so much, but I'm talking about if you're running third and there's five to go and a guy in front of you is holding you up a little bit, but he can't really go anywhere either. You kind of get that mentality of, you know what, maybe third is the best we're going to have tonight. Where 15 years ago, I might have said, oh, there's two more. I got to get out of my way. Right. So uh, the older you get, you got to kind of you got to kind of have that mentality. And, and the, the the Burt Myers and the Tim Browns of the world that have raced at Bowman Gray, who have over the time have gradually adopted that theory mm-hmm. are the ones that have got the most championships at the end of the day. Yeah, no, I, I get you. We are we're getting close uh, right. to the end of the show, but we are uh, there's just a few more things I, I got to ask you about. Um, 
number one, uh, uh, the, the North South shootout is coming up in, in a couple of weeks. The super modifieds are coming back. Um, you had an experience with a super modified that did not go your way. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what to happened. To say the least. Yeah. So, um, when we were at Concord years ago and we were running, modifieds were running 15 ones, 15 flattish. And the Supers came in and it ran 12 nines. And I was like, man, I got to drive one of those cars. <laughs> so a couple of years goes by and Chad Kepley called me and he said, there's a guy that's got a car. He had back surgery. He can't drive it. Did you say you want to drive a Super? I was like, heck yeah, I want to drive a Super. So they were coming to Ace. Well, Ace was one of my tracks mm -hmm. that I've had a lot of success at. I was like, man, this is going to be awesome. Well, I'll, I'll try to make it quick. But as we were leading up to that race, month or so, two months away, I ran into a friend of mine older guy he said i heard you're gonna drive a super modified i said yeah man i can't wait he said you sure that's a good idea i was like man yeah what are you talking about yeah it's gonna be awesome a couple weeks go by different guy different time i heard you're gonna drive a super modified yeah you sure about that and those <laughs> things are wild i said yeah man what do you mean like i'm you know you're the crazy one here right, what do right. you mean you don't want to drive a super modified right, right. so then my wife says uh, we go to north wilkesboro uh, for that race whatever year it was that they were having an exhibition type race there and they brought that car there to promote the super modified race at ace and the guy had me climb in it and you had to duck under the wing and oh, all yeah. that stuff right mm -hmm. my wife says you sure that car's you sure you want to drive that car i was like what is wrong with you people this is a super modified i've seen these things on the racetrack right so uh, we go to A Speedway, and it was the Friday night before uh, we had a NASCAR Southern Well and Modified Tour race at South Boston the next day on Saturday. Right. The reason I remember this, I think it was April 15th. My wife's birthday is April 17th. And they were doing a birthday thing for my wife at work that day. So it was me and three of my buddies, and we go there, and I get in the car, I put my hands on, and I say, okay, everything's cool. I'm going to go use the bathroom real quick. I go in the bathroom. As I'm coming back out, and I kind of stop, and I just stood there a minute, and I said, Lord, please don't let me get hurt in this car. I don't know why. Something came on me, right? Right. So I go out, and I get in the car, and they push me off, and about, I think it was the fourth or fifth lap, going into one of the throttle sticks and just destroys it. So I get out. I'm walking across, and I get over there, and I sit down. I'm just, I can't sit down. So I said, let me lay down. I lay down. I said, well, I can't lay down. And I stand up, and one of the older guys comes over. that was driving one of the cars. He comes over. He says, hey, man, you need to go to the hospital and get checked out. Well, in my mind, you know what I'm thinking. i got to race tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If I go to the hospital and NASCAR gets wind of this, <clears throat> they're not going to let me race tomorrow. Right. So I'm not going to the hospital. So the longer I sat there, my adrenaline's coming down. I'm feeling more pain. I'm just, man, all right, all right, all right. I'll go get checked out. They could banish me up. I'll be able to race tomorrow. <laughs> so they call the ambulance. They get me there, and I call Kim. I said, Kim, here's the deal. I crashed, but I'm okay. She said, Bert, don't play with me. I said, Kim, seriously, I, I, I crashed this super modified. Throttle stuck, and I crashed, but I'm okay. They're going to take me to the hospital. Where are you going? Where are you going? I said, Kim, you don't have to come. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm trying to downplay this as much as possible because in my mind, my main focus is I got to race tomorrow. Right. Right? people once again you think we're crazy they take me to Alamance Medical whatever it was and when she showed up they got the neck collar on me and you know you think I'm laying there half dead and come to find out I had three broken ribs he called them riblets because they were broke completely in two had a punctured lung two ruptured discs in my back uh -huh. doctor comes in and he's telling me all this stuff I said okay well uh, I gotta race tomorrow he goes, excuse me? <laughs> I said, man, I got to race tomorrow. You got to get me out of here. And actually, the call from NASCAR beat me to the hospital. They oh, already had found out that Yeah, quick. word got out. The word got out that quick. <laughs> and they're like, you know, we got he's got to be cleared before he can race. The doctor says, you can race tomorrow, but it won't be because I say you can. I'm like, man, you don't understand. I got to race tomorrow. So finally get it in my mind, I'm not going to race tomorrow. So I start making phone calls, and I finally get in touch with Lee Jeffries, and Lee Jeffries is going to drive my car rain's coming in we get word and they've postponed the race till sunday so now i'm back in the game right, you know right. I'm like, all right that's an extra day <laughs> i'm good so doctor says look dude you don't understand all it would take is one little bump up and one of them ribs turn sideways and you will die before they get you back here mm -hmm. it, it's not going to happen so i'm like man god what am i going to do here so Saturday afternoon, they're going to race on Sunday at South Boston. Lee Jeffries is going to drive my car. I was driving for Philip. No, I remember. I had to do the pit report. Yeah. It was on speed. I, you know, I had to say that yeah. you got hurt in a super modified and so, Lee was running. Yeah. So um, we're, we're in there in the dock. I said, Doc, look, 
you got to get me out of here. Okay, fine, I'm not going to race, but you got to get me out of here. He goes, you don't understand, dude. You got three broken ribs, a punctured lung. By now, they've already got that tube in there, and I mean, that was fun. And he said, you got ruptured discs and broken ribs and all this stuff. You, you know, I said, look, have you ever been to a dance and watched somebody dance with your wife? He said, well, no, no, no. I said, well, let me think. Let me tell you something even worse. Imagine if your wife went with somebody and you were at home yeah. knowing that he was out there dancing with your wife. <laughs> well, what's your point? I said, there's a guy going to drive my race car tomorrow. Can I at least be there to watch it? He said, I'll tell you what, dude. First thing in the morning, we're going to x-ray. And if the air pocket is smaller, like where they it's got the tube thing, right? If it's smaller, then I'll let you go watch. So in the morning, we x-rayed and it was actually smaller. And I got to sit up in the booth and watch Lee Jeffries drive my car that day. But um, now I'll go back to the story with Kim. <laughs> she had her birthday party thing at work that day on the 15th. Mm -hmm. Do you know what her wish was when she blew the candles out? That you'd be okay. That I didn't get hurt in that car. That was before she knew I crashed. Uh, her birthday wish was for me not to get hurt in that car. No kidding. So when Kim says no more super modifieds, I say, okay, fine. No more super modifieds. So yeah. I still, there's a part of me that wants to drive. Man, they are just, they are so awesome. So I can't wait when they come. I at least get to watch them. But you can't, but you yeah. can't drive one. Can't, you know, I've been, I've been told no. So. Uh, well, maybe uh, talk her into a sprint car. Or uh, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe you know, maybe we'll we'll take baby steps, something like we'll that. Take That'd baby be steps. The pavement sprint car be fine for yeah. you, you know. Yeah. But no more super modifieds. No more super. Uh, that sucks. Um, how did Lee do in that race that day? He got a I seventh or five. eighth. Yeah, yeah, seventh or eighth, maybe it was something. A yeah, it wasn't five. bad. It's when wasn't the car bad. was black and orange. It was black. It was orange on top and right. black on the bottom. It's actually a car Daniel Beeson bought it from us and okay. raced it at the stadium. It was orange and blue with a forty four on it. That right. same car. I won both North South shootouts in that car. So that was that was one of my favorite cars. Okay, yeah. cool. Uh Chris is in my ear telling me to wrap it up we gotta hurry okay. i know i know we gotta well, you hurry. knew when you had me on here what you were in for. oh no i know i know I, I, and believe me but this is this is where we have the opportunity to have you come back as a second guest yeah but before you go one more quick story okay and i was there for it the 2010 nascar Wheelands southern modified tour championship that was one of the most memorable nights I ever had on pit road because there was fighting, there was arguing, there was uh, the car, you sitting in victory lane for at least 30 minutes while they figured out the points. Just tell us, tell us what happened. Well, we knew that we knew it was a long shot. I think what were we third or fourth in points? Um, points weren't even on our mind. Uh, what was on our mind was, is we're coming to a track that everybody says this is like Bowman Gray's flat quarter mile. We brought our BGS car. Um, if you win, you get to celebrate in the big Charlotte victory lane. Um, that was what was on our mind. We didn't even – points never crossed our mind. I don't think points even – You came, were fourth in points think, coming into yeah, the race. excuse me, I think so. So I don't think points even were, were in the conversation until after I won the race. And I want to say that somebody came on the radio, Scott or McCruchy, somebody came on the radio and said, I think we might have just won the whole thing. And I said, Huh? Because I knew there was LW and Savali or whatever. Right, I was, knew there was some controversy. And Georgie, Georgie was leading, and LW and Savali were second and third, I think. Yeah. And you were fourth, but everyone was close, technically, in points. Georgie broke, and then Savali and LW got together, and that had, then, of course, the fight, the fight <laughs> yeah. in the pit afterwards. afterwards. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, but I, I, we, never even, we never even thought points whatsoever. And when I won the race and driving around trying to find Victory Lane, and like I said, we sat there for 30 minutes because they were like, well, I think we won the whole thing. I think we won the whole thing. And then next thing you know, we're shooting champagne in the air. and We won the race and the championship and everything. So uh, it was a very memorable night for me as well. Was that um, one the most unexpected championship you ever oh, had? Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Most of my championships at Bowman Gray, um, you know, they've come down to the last, you know, right there at the end. But not in a fashion where you're way behind mm -hmm. and you 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 leapfrog everybody because of certain stuff that went on um but those are the nights you 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 cherish because they don't happen very often right now i get <laughs> it uh okay we're about to wrap it up but okay. uh, one thing we do at the end of the show is we plug and promote so like what if uh what have you got going on? Your sponsors? What races you got coming up? Where can we find all, all kinds of information on Burt Myers? Your uh, your social media, all that. Let's hear it. Well, I, I'm not big on the, the. I've got a the Citrus Safe team handles a lot of my social media stuff, but obviously on Facebook, um, 
this coming weekend we have South Boston coming up for the Smart Tour. The following weekend's our finale at North Wilkesboro. Mm -hmm. I actually have to win. If I win South Boston, I automatically advance to North Wilkesboro. If I don't win South Boston, then I can't point my way in. So our goal this weekend is to go to South Boston and win the race. Uh, oh, some, that's right, because the Smart has playoffs. They have right? the playoff thing, yeah. So uh, somewhat, so it's kind of ironic. Where that are you sitting in points right now? Right now I'm f fifth. Fifth. I'm fifth. So you have me, to be in the top three in points? You have to be in the top three. And I think me and Ryan Newman are in the same boat. We're fourth and fifth, and I don't think either one of us have enough points to point our way in. So me or Ryan Newman, to be able to get to the top three, have to win. Uh, if one of us wins, it bumps one of those top three out. So uh, it, it's going to be a very interesting weekend. It's, but it's kind of ironic that you brought up the whole 2010 thing because we were not expected to be that guy. Right. Um, I feel like that we've got a really good shot to win the race. We went and tested last week, and we got a really good car. Um, if anything, I'm due because I've never won it in South Boston. So uh, <laughs> we're due. Um, but, yeah, we got that coming up. Then the North South Shootout a couple weeks later. Um, but yeah, I want to. Yeah, I got to take the time to thank Citra Safe, uh, Peanut Patch, uh, Choice Tire and Automotive. Um, man, I know I'm forgetting Backyard Leisure, uh, PSR, NASCAR Institute, Bubba mm -hmm. Speed Shop, Philip Smith, still a big part of our team. Um, I don't take the time enough to thank Kim and the kids and everything for what they do. Whenever we have stories like this and we talk about what they sacrifice and kind of how I drag them around all over the place going racing. So, uh, there's just I can sit here you don't have enough time for me to thank everybody that helps make this possible you know right. what I mean Bryson Brothers Aerial Solutions that's alright we'll have you back for another episode yeah we'll come back and do it again and, yeah. Yeah, now that you have fun today I had a great time I had right. a great time yeah I love well, you know me I like I like reminiscing and, and we call it bent tracing bent tracing is free right bent tracing is free it doesn't cost you anything yeah. so. and well one of the, the goals too with that we try to do with this show is that you didn't have to make it to cup or indy car to be sitting in that seat you know the, the person sitting in that seat is a, a hero in their own right or a legend. <laughs> well i appreciate that. you definitely exemplify <laughs> what you know people know know as a local hero because we need more of that in short track racing well, thanks because, man. i appreciate yeah, that i I'll appreciate it. thank you for thank coming you. here thank you very Derek. cool bert myers joins us on the Derek pernasiglio show we want to thank you all for tuning into this episode and remember to follow us on our social media channels you can follow us on facebook at the Derek pernasiglio show on youtube under the same name Hit that like and subscribe button down below and uh, you know give us a follow. The more subscribers, the better off we are. And then you can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and on uh, TikTok at Real DP Show. And uh, we want to thank all of you for joining us. And for Burt Myers, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you the next time. Bye. <laughs>